Of course. All right, folks. 14, and we're going to read just one verse and then consider a number of other scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 37. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. The Apostle Paul writing here, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Let's open in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we have your word to read, believe, and trust. And as we read what the Apostle Paul has to say to us here today, Lord, we came, can come to acknowledge your word as absolute truth. We give you thanks and praise in and through Christ Jesus. Amen. So when the Apostle Paul is writing here to the Corinthians, and we get to 1 Corinthians 14, you know, when he when he talks about if any man think himself to be a prophet. Now notice what it says, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual. In other words, if somebody thinks and believes, well, you know what, I'm the, I'm the prophet of God. I'm the one who's going to bring you God's word. I am the spiritual one. I'm the leader. Paul says, if he think himself to be that. Now notice, it's not saying God has said that's who he is. It's the person thinking that they are that. Let them acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So if we want to assess and see if someone is really, truly spiritual and being guided by the truth of God's word, you know what they should be doing? Acknowledging the apostleship of the Apostle Paul and the fact that he has brought this further complete revelation from God's word. We acknowledge and know the whole word of God, all 66 books of the Bible. Are important but specifically today to get our marching orders if I can put it to you that way we would need to recognize and realize the writings of the Apostle Paul because he brings and he ties up the Old Testament and he brings clarity of what was being declared in Matthew Mark Luke and John you are not going to get the full complete story and an understanding of scripture if you don't recognize the apostleship of the apostle paul many believe the apostle paul replaced judas that he was the 12th apostle but we know through study of scripture the matthias was the one who replaced judas so peter and the 11 the 12 apostles paul the apostle he's an apostle apostle means sent one messenger of god was appointed by God, but he was not one of the twelve. And that's very important we understand that. Because the Apostle Paul is not going to be one of the twelve apostles ruling the twelve tribes of the nation of Israel. He is the one who brings a message today, and we're going to look at this, that brings a message complete to Jew and Gentile alike. Behind me is the board. We've shared this with you before. We don't get our doctrine out of this board, but I love what, what the way it displays from a visual perspective of what actually is happening in Scripture. And that when the, when the uh, religious leaders of the day and the Jews were looking at the time when Jesus Christ was on earth, they did not know and understand this message that the Apostle Paul was going to bring. They recognized... And understood just what the prophetic scriptures had declared or should have recognized. They did not know this mystery that the Apostle Paul was now revealing. And God did not reveal it. The Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father, the Holy Spirit did not reveal it to any of the angels. Neither Gabriel, Michael, none of the top uh, ranking angels knew. Satan himself who was the covering cherub, who was right in the throne room of God, did not know about this. And the reason that he pushed for the cross was because he did not know the final plan of God. He didn't know that God was going to complete the message, uh, uh, the, the provision for you and I, as, whether we Jew or Gentile. And because of that, Satan pushed for the cross. Satan wasn't surprised when the Lord Jesus Christ rose on the third day because he could see from Scripture that was going to happen. But what surprised him 
was the plan of God that God had in revealing this message of, of God's grace. Because Satan, in Satan's mind, God was going to work through the nation of Israel. And if that was the case, well, who then did he have to just work against? The nation of Israel. Now, Satan looks at what's happening today and, and, and realizes and recognizes that God is now no longer working through a specific nation. He's working in and through the church the body of Christ. So have a look with me. And, and therefore it's important when we consider this. Where Look at verse 33 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. For God is not the author of confusion. God is not the author of confusion. But of peace as in all the churches of the saints. So, think about this with me. If we see confusion in Christian circles today, if we see confusion and chaos in religious circles, if we see confusion and chaos in church services, is that of God? No. God is a God of order. He's a God of structure. He certainly doesn't want us to be all sort of like, Hello, uh, you know. We need to be rejoicing. In the fact that God has provided this free gift of salvation for us. But we certainly must now not be in a way where we are bringing confusion in our services and in, in the situations that we find ourselves in. So what really happened? Well, go with me to the book of Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. We sang that in the song we sang, where is the Lord Jesus Christ right now? Seated at the right hand of God. You ever wondered where the term, he's my right hand man, my right hand person. You know, we, 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 we say these things. Well, where would, we, where would we get the idea that it is important for the person to be at your right hand? You know, <laughs> I must smile because even... Lost people don't understand where they get many of their sayings. You know that there is a good Samaritan law, which states that if you stop and you're assisting and you're helping someone, and you're doing all that you can, but that person then suffers injury or whatever the case may be, that the good Samaritan law protects the person who has stopped. Otherwise, we'd like... I'm not touching you. Well, where do you think we got the Good Samaritan idea from? Think about that for a moment. You just look out in creation. God has put on display his magnificence. And even in the way that mankind has misused and abused the world today, we can still see that creation. There, are, there, there is something just so fantastic about creation. So, Man, the Bible says, is without excuse. So, I told you to go to where? Acts chapter 7. All right? So go there. Acts chapter 7. And keep your hand in Acts chapter 7. And then go with me to Romans chapter 1. Don't let go of Acts chapter 7. Romans chapter 1. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. We have a choice. We have a choice. Do we believe? Do we trust? We can either trust or reject this notion that God is going to choose some for salvation or cause you to believe. God speaks to us through his word and you understand and recognize the important role that you have. The greatest, the greatest thing that you can do for anyone, including your enemies, is ensure that they know the gospel. Think about that for a moment. Verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall live by faith. Not by your ability, not by your works, not by the amount of work that you can do to make God, you know, allow you into heaven. 
Look at verse 20 now. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are what? Clearly seen. How are the invisible things clearly seen? Being understood by the things that are made. I'm not talking about the untarred roads or the potholes. <laughs> That's man. I'm talking about God's creation. Being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead. So that they are what? Without excuse. You see that? They are without excuse. Sometimes when you're sharing the gospel, someone there, what's the most common thing? Yeah, but what about the guy in deepest, darkest Africa? What does that verse say? God will judge them according to the understanding that they have. God is a just God. But then I always turn around and say, but that man's there, I'm not there. I'm right here now with you. What about you? And, and, and we need to be careful that we don't say it in an arrogant way. You know, we must be cautious of that in the way that we present it. But at the same time, we need to know that they are without excuse. Folks, God is in control in this way, that God will make the final choice and decision. You know, watch the rugby. Goodness gracious, it wasn't that an intense game. And then we could come and say, yeah, but the ref did, and yeah, but he didn't see the, and I mean, you know, it's like in a stadium like that, you've got 50,000, or I mean, many people, you know, people that we all have our own idea, but at the end of the day, this verse clearly says they will be without excuse, without excuse. So, go back with me now to Acts chapter 7, where I wanted you to be in the first place. Acts chapter 7. And we're just going to go from verse 51, but let me just give you the understanding. So, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen, the Holy Spirit is speaking through Stephen. So, what Stephen is saying, God the Holy Spirit is speaking through Stephen and um, bringing... The nation of Israel, he's literally giving them a, hi a his history lesson of where they'd come from, what had happened, and why they were where they were now. These 71 member Sanhedrin, you know, were sitting around, and, and, and the idea was they would sit around, and, and Stephen would be down in the middle. Literally, they were going to be judging him now, and he yet, through the Holy Spirit, living with, uh, uh, um, working through him, brings this message to the nation of Israel. And if you read through that, please take the time and trouble when you, when you can to go through Acts chapter 7 and you'll begin to see, um, you know, what happened. And he gives them the, this whole history lesson and why they ended up where they were. And then he gets right to the end uh, and verse, let's pick up in verse 51, where Stephen, now understand, this is not Stephen now getting to the point where, let's say, for example, I have been dealing with folks before in the, in, in, in the years gone, and, and then sometimes my flesh gets in the way, and boy, oh boy, it gets frustrating. Right? And you get, and you're just like, ach, nie man. It's just kind of not going to get it. You know what I'm saying? This is not Stephen getting to that point. Because he's, the Holy Spirit is speaking through him. This is not Stephen just throwing his arms up in dismay. This is, this is the Holy Spirit speaking through Stephen. So when he gets to this and he says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So do ye. Which of the prophets have your fathers, have not your fathers persecuted? And have they slain them? which showed before of the coming of the just one. You see that? So the prophetic scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, spoke of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Stephen is saying, you're stiff-necked. You're uncircumcised. You're not. What happens when you're stiff-necked? You, you, you know, you're not, you're not, you, you, you can't really... Move. You're, not, you're not able to see. You're not clearly seeing what's happening. You're not... You're stiff-necked. You, you know, standing... Oh, Please, you can't teach me anything. And uncircumcised in heart. They were physically circumcised Jews. But their phys physical circumcision, which was a sign that they were separate from the Gentile world, meant nothing if there was no spiritual circumcision. 
And he says, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? In other words, the, the prophets that the Lord had used in time past had been persecuted, had been rejected. And they had got to the point where even now, at the time that Stephen is speaking, they have, Paul writes, he says, they had the oracles of God. They have the Old Testament scriptures, which clearly show the coming of the just one. Notice that. And they'd rejected it. So they had rejected God the Father's teaching to them of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 53, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. They gnashed on him. They didn't get, have this mindset of, oh, hang on, I'm wrong. Uh, what, what do we need to do? They gnashed on him with their teeth. <laughs> Anger! But he, that's Stephen now, being full of the Holy Ghost, lifted, looked up steadfastly into heaven. Now, I, I look at that, and that word steadfastly, you know what that means? With intensity. Not just but steadfastly. Looking up. You know, you know when, when, you, when you're at the, the shopping center, now I'm not talking about someone you see that you don't want to see, but someone you genuinely don't see. You know the difference, right? It's like when you go down, oh, don't want to see that person. What are these peas? They really are interesting. Let me read the. I'm talking, you know, the person, you just genuinely don't see the person. Um, you know, up until two and a half years ago, when I, until I had my corneal transplant, I would often be said, yes, but Aiden, I waved at you and you didn't, you didn't see me. And I'd say, well, what side of you, of me were you on? And then they'd say, no, but, and then I'd work out and say, okay, but you, if you were on my right side, I wouldn't see anything there because I could only see from, from that. I don't have that excuse anymore. But anyway, <laughs> so, so now if I don't greet you in the shops, it's either because I genuinely don't see you, uh, I, Anyway, but he looked steadfastly. That, that idea there, I mean, think about this. These guys are gnashing on him. They, they, they're coming at him, right? He's not fearful. That's the point. He's just steadfastly. I mean, I don't know about you, but if the Lord Jesus Christ had to suddenly appear to me, I, I, I'm sorry, guys, but I'm not going to be looking at you, right? So Stephen is looking up steadfastly. Now, know what the scripture says. Into heaven, he's looking up into heaven, and he saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Now, the, the, the scriptures teach us that, that Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God. But here he was standing. Why? Because he was getting ready to come and pour out his judgment and wrath upon the world. And upon the nation of Israel. So Stephen sees this. And said behold. I see the heavens opened. And the son of man. Standing on the right hand of God. Now. Think through this with me now. If you are in front. Of the 71 member Sanhedrin. Who claim to know the scriptures. What are you going to know. About Jesus standing. Or God standing. It's in a biki moilakate, right? That's my understanding. You're free to disagree with me, but folks, I'm just, I'm just trying to put you in the picture there. This is not Stephen, what's happened? He, he, he knows he's facing this 71 member Sanhedrin. The man, he's filled with the Holy Ghost. He's standing there. He's not standing in his own prideful way. He's not standing in his own strength, but he's standing and he's looking at God. And he says, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God, then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. Ah, we don't want to hear this. <laughs> Why? Because they, they knew. It's like, we don't want it. They, you know, don't tell us this. No, I, I don't want to hear. They cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one cord. A cord. I mean, they all just went at him like a mob and cast him out of the city and stoned him. 
And the witnesses laid their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen. Now notice, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus Christ, wipe out these enemies of mine and make sure you take judgment. Oh, sorry, no, that's... What does it say? And calling upon them and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, that falling asleep was he didn't take a nap. He died. But the Bible talks about those who sleep in Jesus. But here's the point. Stephen, even though he was being judged by this, this, this council, even though he knew the religious leaders were against him, knew and understood the magnitude of what actually was taking place. That's the point. His great desire was that these folks would actually come to a point of repentance. And repentance there doesn't mean to say sorry. Biblical repentance is a changed mind. God repented. He changed his mind. You know, when folks say, oh, you must repent. Well, what does the word repentance mean? It does not mean, it, it means a changed mind. It means that he, would, he had prayed for this. And, and you'll see even afterwards when Peter is now preaching after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, repent, change your thinking, change your mind. The point I want you to see here, folks, is the great, and I just look at this, can, can you get an idea here of the love that Stephen had for these? And they were who? His enemies? So when you hear the scriptures say, pray for your enemies, I think of this. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying you must get it, you know, you must just become a doormat and you must, but, but the point is don't carry the hatred in your heart. Because you know what's going to happen? It's going to eat you up like, like a cancer. You certainly have to get to a point where you decide, okay, that's it. I'm withdrawing myself from this now. I'm not going to go back. You know, I'm going to get out of the circumstance and situation. But don't allow, I, I get to some folks in 10 years down the line, man, they are still carrying this hurt, hatred, and, 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 and you know, I want, I, want, I want revenge. Boy, oh boy, how can you enjoy life? How can you be a witness for God? I un understand we go through emotions. I understand we go through grief. I understand that. But let us practically do the things that we need to do to remove ourselves from that circumstance or situation, but not allow ourselves to be controlled by the hate that we, that, and, and, and the anger. Now, you know, we need to realize that it, it will take some time. But here's Stephen, and he's saying this. Why? Look at, look at chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. Now, by the way, that Saul is the apostle Paul. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. You, you know, we talk about that pastor that I mentioned that, that's passed away in America, his, his congregation. They will be saddened and lamented. But at the same time, what should we also have? The rejoicing of knowing, absent from the body, present with the Lord. So when we recognize and we realize this, this is the picture. So when God saw this and when, when they had now rejected the Holy Spirit, and Jesus says, you know, you can reject the Son of Man. They'd rejected God the Father through rejecting his word. They'd rejected the Lord Jesus Christ by crucifying him. But when they rejected what the Holy Spirit was saying now through Stephen, they had in essence committed what is known as the unpardonable sin. They had rejected the Holy Spirit. You know what the beautiful thing is? Is you have right up until you take your last breath to acknowledge what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross at Calvary. You can reject and reject and reject and reject, and God will continue to give you. He is a long-suffering God, and he will continue to give you opportunity. 
but there will come a time when you take your last breath on this earth, your heart beats its last beat, and if you have not got to that point, then unfortunately, sadly, heaven is not your home. So you have right up until then. So God is not going to get and say, oh, well, that's it. You, you've, you've rejected the Holy Spirit, so I'm rejecting you. Right up until that moment. But if you refuse and you do not, you will have committed the unpardonable sin because once you take your last breath and you leave your physical body, you can't then say, whoops, I was wrong. It's too late. And that's where the angels who fell they don't have a chance. They don't have a second chance. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. God sends nobody to hell. We choose to go there by rejection of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. Go with me to the book of Ephesians. Just by way of a bit of recap, we looked at this last week. But Ephesians chapter 2 verse 15. So because the nation of Israel had now by representation of their religious leaders, rejected the Holy Spirit. God could now not continue using them and, 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 and fulfill the prophetic program. It is for that reason that God then used the secret plan, the mystery plan that he had, that only God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit knew about, and converted Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, where Saul was still going out. And I mean, they'd stoned Stephen, and he's like, woohoo, let's carry on with this. And he got letters from the synagogues. Can you imagine? They'd stoned Stephen, and Saul goes and says, you know what? Give me letters of authority. I'll go and sort all these other Christians, these believers out. And that's what had happened. And on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, the Lord Jesus Christ calls to Paul from heaven's glory. Now, When Saul of Tarsus heard the Lord Jesus Christ speak, if Stephen looked up and saw heaven's glory and was <laughs> encouraged by that and could stand firm by that, despite the fact that he, he I believe he knew he was going to be taken because he, he says, you know, lay not this at their charge. I, I believe Stephen knew that he was going to die that day when he saw what was happening. And now Paul, Saul of Tarsus, is on the road to Damascus. He looks up and he hears a voice from heaven he doesn't like, ah, yeah, okay. It's like, oh Lord, please don't, don't let me know. Just let this not be the Lord Jesus Christ that I'm hearing now. And he's converted on that, on that road. And his conversion brings him to a point that even if you look at the life of the Apostle Paul from that moment on, he began boldly preaching. What changed? What changed? Well, he was, he's the only grace believer to, 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 to um, have that direct communication with the Lord. And, and that's why it is important we recognize and realize what God is doing and working through the Apostle Paul. And then when we hear what he says and we take the Old Testament scriptures and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we put it all together, we see this plan of this period now that is yellow on this chart, which is a, for the last 2,000 years, God's grace. Notice now Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of two one new man, so making peace. When did God abolish the law against us in his flesh? When the Lord Jesus Christ physically hung on the cross at Calvary. When Christ Jesus says, said, it is finished. He didn't say it's almost finished. It's half done. It's 99% done. It is finished. And if Jesus Christ said it is finished, is it finished? Yes. Now, Paul the Apostle brings this revelation of what God was actually accomplishing on the cross. Because Satan looked at this and thought, okay, Christ is crucified, dead, he's resurrected. Okay, I knew about that. I could see that in the scriptures. But I've still got this plan for what Satan didn't know because Satan thought, well, okay, well, the nation of Israel is lost now because they've committed the unpardonable sin, so I've at least got them. Now all of a sudden, Satan looks at the plan says, but hang on. I didn't see any of this in Scripture. 
Where did I see in Scripture that Ephesians chapter 2, verse uh, 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 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Hang on, that wasn't, in the, uh, that wasn't part of the plan. And, you know, now, verse 13, but now in Christ you were sometimes a far off or made not. Hang on, I didn't see any of this. You can just imagine Satan looking at this and I didn't see any of this where, where the Gentiles are going to be part of, of this, of the same body, of the, where God is going to save the Jews and the Gentiles together now. That wasn't revealed in the Old Testament scriptures. That wasn't revealed by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Satan, I can tell you folks, is as mad as a snake. Use the pun. Part of his, he's also known as the serpent. You look in Genesis, the serpent, he wasn't just some tiny little slithery snake. He was a very beautiful creature to look upon. Revelation calls him the serpent. So when you look at this and you see this plan that God has, has now revealed, Satan has no answer to refute that other than this. So confusion. Bring confusion. Because the Bible says he's the prince of the power of the air. Bring confusion. Use the music in the world to confuse. Where music was for worship and, 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 and honoring God. Well, let's bring that to confusion. Where Christians gather in churches. Let's bring chaos. Let's make it about emotion. Let's not make it about truth. I don't know about you. I get excited when I see this stuff. That's not that we, you know, I'm very excited that the Lord Jesus Christ died for me on the cross at Calvary. And I just want to tell you that you need to believe. No, 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 no. Guys, I'm excited. <laughs> okay. But I'm not judging and assessing who I am in Christ based on how I feel. Because I don't know about you, but some days I get up and my body says, you can go on, I'll catch up an hour or two later. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Okay? Or well, my emotions say, hang on, I can't do this today. Listen, if I got up and did what I did based on what my body said and what my emotions said, he. So what I do is I look at, the, at who I am in Christ Jesus, I look at the Word of God, and it's God's Word that motivates me. I've got to get up. I've got to do this. Why? Because it's that that motivates me. And, and I'm sure everyone here and you folk online are listening to this after event can relate to that. Why? Because we, we, we have great times, but we have challenging times, right? It is just part of life. And that's why we need to recognize and realize the writings of the Apostle Paul bring us to this place of understanding. This. The one new man, Jew and Gentile, together now. You wonder why we have all the wars and the things happening in the Middle East? Do you think it's just coincidence? Or do you think Satan is wanting us to focus there? You see, God is not working in and through the nation of Israel right now. But does the Bible say he's going to work through the nation of Israel? Yes. Satan doesn't know when. We don't know when we are going to go to be with the Lord in the catching away, right? None of us really know. See, Pastor Quibus was wearing a t-shirt. Perhaps today. <laughs> Came on, when, I saw, when I went to greet him this morning, he says, perhaps today. And I said, you're right, but I hope it's today. We don't know. But we don't know. But Satan knows that once, the, he now knows once that happens, what's God going to do? Hello? He's going to go back to the prophetic program and again begin to work through that nation. So do you not think Satan's now trying to bring chaos and world hatred against the nation of Israel? Satan knew that God was going to bring the nation of Israel out of the land of Egypt. That when they came out, what did they find? They found. What did they find? Giants in the land they were supposed to occupy. Walled cities. Why? Well, Satan knew something was coming, so let's occupy the land. 
So understand that what we see happening in the Middle East, I do not believe is any coincidence. The, the, the word of God tells us in the book of Thessalonians, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Satan's already, man, he's got his, his plans going out through the world. And we need to recognize and realize what is happening, but we need to not be caught up in it. Because what he wants us to be doing is not to, during this age of grace and God's long suffering, as Peter writes, he, does, he doesn't want us to be getting out there and sharing the message of grace. Thank you, 10 minutes. He wants us to be busy with all sorts of other, and I'm going to use the word stuff. It's a Bible word. Did you know that? If you've got Blue Letter Bible, go on to the King James and type in stuff, and you'll see the whole bunch of reasons. Scriptures using the word stuff. I like that word. It's, it's just things, sometimes unimportant. And he wants us to be busy with all that. I'm busy arguing about that. Now, there's some interesting things, and I love looking at that and how things are planning out. But we've got to be careful we don't get caught up in it. That's the point I'm trying to make. He wants us to be busy with that. So God, the, the title of my message is a question. Did God call time out? Yes, he did. What is the time out this year? Because if the Lord Jesus Christ was standing and Stephen looked up to him and Jesus had said that those living at that time, that generation, and a generation is normally 40 years, would not pass away till they saw the Lord return. But they didn't. Why? Because God called time out. Time out. So we're still living in the time, if I can put it this way, in the time out period of time. Because, I mean, if you go to a game... You know, and there's time out. Does everyone sit? No, I mean, people go, time out. Oh, well, well, I'm going to the bathroom quickly and get some cooling. Or get, you know, things happen. But the game doesn't carry on. So the prophetic program is on time out. So nothing we see today happening is part of the prophetic program. Now, that doesn't mean you can't see like what's happening in, in Israel right now and say, oh, I can actually see how some of the stuff will play out. But that's not God causing that to happen. You follow what I'm saying? So because of this, time out was called. Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. Look at, uh, well, let's go from verse 14. Look what Paul writes and he says, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Now, are you a new creature? The Bible says yes. The moment you believe and trust the gospel, you're a new creature. You still live in your old body. You still have the, the sinful wiring that is in your physical body. But you are a new creature. And that's why Paul is saying neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. So today, it doesn't matter. A Jew cannot claim and say, I'm a circumcised Jew of the tribe of Benjamin. God let me into heaven, God said. You needed to trust my son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But in time past, did that matter? Yes. But now it doesn't. So what we are living in is this, this period of time where we are saved by God's grace through faith in Christ. Go with me to Matthew chapter 12. And we're just quickly going to look at a couple of scriptures here. I said to you I was going to cut the message short. I don't know, when, when, when I preach, folks, you've you, you got to understand, my, my clock says I've only been talking for five minutes. So I do apologize. Matthew 5, uh, uh, sorry, Matthew 12, verse 31 and 32. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy, that word blasphemy is slanderous speaking, evil speaking, going against, shall be forgiven unto men. 
But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. You see, when, the, when those religious leaders rejected what Stephen was saying, saying they, didn't, they were not rejecting Stephen, they were rejecting who? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. So God called time out, changed the program, and ushered in this period of God's grace. And for 2,000 years now, we have been under that program. And people are saying, yeah, but you know, when's this going to happen? And I mean, you know, can you really believe and trust what God said? Well, go with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, and we read from verse 8. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And remember we said that word repentance means a changed mind, recognizing that, hang on, my thinking, my way that I'm, I'm thinking now is wrong. I need to recognize and realize and, and accept and acknowledge Christ Jesus. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Folks, that's scary stuff. And that's going to happen. That's the bad news. You know what the good news is? We're going to be out of here then. We will not face this. And here's my question. Is there anybody that you would say, oh, well, I wish they would face it? Not even your worst enemy. Right? So th this is what we need to recognize and realize. So while people scoff and say, oh, man, please, this is not going to happen. Come on. Don't confuse the long suffering of God for the fact that he's not going to do what he says. Romans 11, 25. Romans 11, 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. They shall come out of Zion a deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Now notice, blindness in part is happened to Israel. For how long? Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. God has called time out. We live in the period in the age of God's grace for 2,000 years now, where we are saved by grace through faith. No works. Faith is the only thing you can do without doing a work in accordance to Scripture. Faith is trusting in what God has done for you. But there's going to come a time where that scripture says, where the fullness of the Gentiles will come in. Now, I'm going to just briefly tell you this, and we'll pick up from this from next week. So there's going to come a time where God is going to look at the Gentile world, and by the way, who is all part of the Gentile world? Jews and Gentiles. When God looks at the world today, he sees Jews and Gentiles as Gentiles. Right? The nation of Israel is not called out special nation in his eyes right now. He's going to use them, but right now they are part of the Gentile world. When the fullness of the Gentiles will come in, there is going to come a time when God is going to look at the Gentile world and he's going to see the Gentile world does not want me. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And all I ask is you just look at what's happening in the world today. We have a lot of religious activity. We have a lot of spiritual activity. We have a lot of things happening. But by and large, man 
is worshipping creation, worshipping self, not looking to the truth of who Christ Jesus is, rejecting the message of his grace. And there's going to come a time when God is going to say, I'm done now. I've given enough time. The Gentile world, by and large, will reject. That won't mean that there's nobody. I mean, I, I don't believe that God's going to get, and there's going to be nobody that's going to be trusting in him because there's always a remnant. We here, we're not a huge uh, group of folks. And yet, you know, the scriptures say, unknown, but yet known. We are known. The angels know. The spiritual world knows. And people need to know and hear us proclaiming the message of God's grace. So until that time, that either we leave here through our physical bodies ceasing to function, i.e. we die physically, or we get called out of here and caught up in the air to meet the Lord, our focus needs to be spreading the gospel. But I don't know when, but boy oh boy, when I look at what's happening, this is my personal understanding, when I look at what's happening in the world today, <clears throat> Now, the Lord can tarry and can be another 50, 100 years. Oh boy, oh boy, when I look at what the Gentile world is doing and how we're getting and going and, and all the, the, the things that are happening in the world today and the mindset of the Gentile world, it's not hard to believe that the time of the Gentiles, as the Scripture says, the fullness of the Gentiles will have come in. I don't know. You decide. Either way, whether it's today, perhaps today, or next week, Whenever the case may be, in years to come, let's get on with the job. Amen. Father God, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you that as we gather today, we can look at your word. And as we consider your word, Lord, help us to stand firm on the truth of your word and take your word seriously and allow it to effectually work in us. And let our focus be spreading the message of your grace so that those who will hear those who have ears to hear will hear and be saved. That when they look at us, Lord, they will see broken, fallen, sinful, fallible man and woman. And yet will know too that we've trusted in our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. And see in us your word working. That is our prayer. That is our hope. We pray this in and through Christ Jesus. Amen.